Hello folks, in this video I'll show how to add animations to your player character where they face and walk in whatever direction that you're moving. I'll be utilizing these sprites which were created and provided by With the Love on OpenGameArt.org. You can download this sprite sheet using the link in the description, or you're free to use whatever sprite sheet you like. Taking a quick look at this image, you'll see that there are four rows, each representing a different direction. Our goal is to use each individual frame from a particular row in order to create the animation. When each frame is played in quick succession, it'll give the illusion that the player is walking. The code I'm starting with is from my player movement video. We have a player object, and in the update function we have this movement code. Also, we are optionally drawing a background, that's optional. But when we start, we can see that I can control this circle with the arrow keys. Or if you have a sprite being drawn for the player, that's fine too. We're going to be changing that in just a second. You can use your own projects for this tutorial, or if you want to follow along using my project, this code is on GitHub, and I have project setup instructions available, so check the description for links to all of that. Once you have your project ready, go ahead and create a sprites folder next to your main.lua if you don't already have one, and inside go ahead and paste in this playersheet.png. Once that's done, back in Visual Studio Code, you should see that in your sprites folder you have a playersheet.png, which means everything's ready to go. We just need to include that file into our code, which we can do that the same as any other sprite. I'll make it a property of the player object, and I'll call it player.spritesheet equals love.graphics.newImage. And then we need the path, which is the sprites folder. And the name of the file is player-sheet.png. Now that this is imported, we'll want to work on turning this into an animation. This will be accomplished using some open source software. In particular, we'll be using this project here called Animate. Again, the link to this is in the description. Although this repo is a few years old now, it's still very reliable and works great for implementing animations in Love2D. There are a few ways to get this code included into your project. If you have Git installed, you could go over to this code dropdown, copy this HTTPS, and then do a Git clone. Or the other way to do this is to download the zip, and once this zip is downloaded, you can go ahead and extract it. And then in here, we will find an animate.lua file. You're going to want to copy this. And back in our project folder, we're going to create a new folder. I'll call it libraries. And in this folder, we're going to paste in that animate.lua. Once you have that pasted in, and you can see it over here, we'll want to go ahead and import this into our code. I'm going to do this right at the top of love.load, and I'm going to say animate equals require libraries, which is that folder we just created, and then the name of the file is animate. So now, all of that animate.lua code is stored in this global variable called animate. At this point, we can start creating our animations. The first step is to create a grid, which helps the library to split your sprite sheet into its individual images. You can check Animate's GitHub page for more details about all of this stuff. So let's start by creating a grid for the player object. I'm going to call it player.grid equals animate.newgrid. And in these parentheses here, there are several parameters we need to define. First is the width and height of each individual frame. And in our case, each frame is 12 pixels wide and 18 pixels tall. If you look closely at the sprite sheet we're using, you'll see that each individual frame has a bit of a gap around it. But when we include that gap, each image is 12 by 18. Then after we define that dimension, we need to give the width and height of the full sprite sheet, which we can get very easily. We'll say player.spritesheet, and then we can say colon get width. So this line here is going to get the width of our sprite sheet, and similarly, we want to get the height for the next parameter, player.spritesheet colon get height. So that is the entire thing we need to define our grid. We have the width and height of our individual frames, and the width and height of the full sprite sheet. And in the end, that gives us our grid. Now using this grid, our code will know how to split our sprite sheet into the individual images. 
and with that we can create our animations. So we're going to store all these animations into a new table actually. I'm going to call it player.animations equals new empty table. And then let's start with just one simple animation. We'll do player.animations.down. This will be the first animation that we'll implement, the down direction. And to create an animation, we do animate.new animation. And then in these parentheses, we need to define what frames from that sprite sheet we want to include. And we do that using the grid. So we'll say player.grid. And then in these parentheses, we need to define what rows and columns we want to include. The first parameter here is the columns we want to include, which is columns one through four, because we have four frames going from left to right. So we say one through four, in single quotes just like this. Then we're gonna put a comma, and then after this we want to define what row we want this to come from, which in our case, the down direction comes from row one. So we'll just put one here. And then after we define our player grid information, we put comma, the next parameter is the time in seconds between each frame. So again, our frames are gonna be playing one after another in quick succession, but we need to define how quickly we want them to go. I'm going to say something like 0.2, and you can adjust this smaller or bigger. This means that the frame is going to change every 0.2 seconds for our animation, which is pretty quick, but you'll see that it looks really natural when we play the animation back. So this is everything we need to define our animation, and it's being stored in this player.animations.down. So I'm going to actually copy this, and now we need to update this animation and draw the animation. So in update after all of this code, I'm going to put in player.animations.down colon update. And this update requires us to pass in DT. And again, DT comes from right here in love.update. We're simply passing this parameter down into our uh, animation update. And then after that's updated, we can go down here and I'm gonna get rid of our circle draw or you can also get rid of any other drawing that you're doing besides the background. And I'm going to do player.animations.down colon draw. And the first parameter here is the sprite sheet that we use to draw this animation, which is player.spriteSheet. Then after this is the position that we want to draw this animation, which is player.x and player.y. And that should do it. We should see the animation playing. So let's save this file and start. And one problem that you'll notice immediately is that this animation is way too small. Since I went with some retro graphics, this sprite is actually only 12 pixels by 18 pixels, which is very small, but we're able to scale it up a little bit. So let's go ahead and in this animations draw, there are some additional parameters very similar to the regular love.graphics.draw function. The next parameter here is the optional rotation field. We don't want to rotate the image, so let's do nil, meaning don't change the rotation. And then after nil is our scale x factor. So we can put in something like 10, and that means the scale of our animation is going to be increased by 10 times. And putting in a value for scale x means that scale y will also adopt that value since we didn't specify anything for it. So with this, we should expect our sprite to be 10 times bigger, or I should say our animation. So let's go ahead and start. And there it is, it is much bigger, but a noticeable problem is that it is blurry. We can prevent our scaling from blurring the images if we go up to the top, and we'll do this right after our animate import. We'll do love.graphics.set default filter. And the values here are nearest, comma, nearest. So with this line in place, it'll make it so that when we scale up our graphics, it doesn't do any blurring. It just simply takes the pixels and scales them up. And now when I start, we see our animation working and it looks pretty good. And since it's tied to the player.x and y values, we can move around normally. But now our next task is to get the other directions working. We have down, but none of the other ones. So let's go ahead and get those implemented. We'll do them in a very similar way that we did down. I'm actually going to copy this entire line right here. And we're going to do the next one. We'll say left. Now the left direction is on the second row. 
So I'm going to change this one to row two. Next up, we have right. Now right is on row three. And then finally, we have up. And up is on row four. Now all of these animations are very similar. They just take place on different rows. Now comes the challenge of changing between the animations, because right now, our animation is being drawn and updated by manually picking out player.animations.down for both here and here, when in reality, we don't know which of the four animations we want to use. We can keep track of this with a new property. I'm going to call it player.anim, and we'll set it equal to some animation. Let's say player.animations.left. So now our player.anim property contains player.animations.left. So we can use this to track our player's animation. So instead of updating manually animations.down, we're instead going to update player.anim. And same with our draw, we're just going to do player.anim draw. This way, whatever animation we have assigned to this value, that's the one we're going to see. So right now we have player.animations.left assigned to it. So if we save and run, we see that the left facing direction is now the animation that we see here. At this point, we just want to change the player's animation to match whatever direction they're moving. This can be done by adding to our movement controls in the update function. For example, here, we are holding down the right arrow key. That means we probably want to change the animation to be player.animations.right. So right in here, I can go ahead and do that. I'll say player.anim equals player.animations.right. And similarly, we can do this exact same thing in all four of these directions. So this one is left, this next one is down, and finally, this last one is up. So with that in place, if I save and run, whenever I change directions, the player's animation gets updated to match that direction. It works pretty well. The only remaining problem here is that the player continues to walk in place even after they stop. And ideally, their animation would also stop and change to a standing still position. Essentially, we want to change the player's image to this frame, the standing one, when no arrow keys are pressed down. You'll notice that the standing frame is the second image in each of these rows. So when no arrow keys are pressed, we'll force the animation to stick with this second frame. This again will happen in our update section. We're going to need to check to see if no arrow keys were pressed that frame. So we'll track this with a very simple local variable. At the start of the frame, we'll create a local is moving, and we'll set this to false. Then we want to change this is moving to true if any of the arrow keys were pressed down this frame. And we can do this again right in this is down if statement. We can just simply say is moving equals true because if the right arrow key is pressed down, that means we are moving. So we need to change this value. And I'm just going to copy this line and put it within all four of these if statements for each of the four directions. So at the end of our update method, we will know that is moving is going to be either false if no arrow keys were pressed down, or true if any of them were pressed down. And if none of them were pressed down, and let's see, if is moving is equal to false, then at this point in this if statement, we want to change the player's animation to be that second frame where they're just standing still. And this is done with player.anim, and there's a colon go to frame function. And the frame we want to go to is frame number two, that standing still frame. If we save and run now, the player is standing still. As soon as I move, he starts walking again in all four directions. And when I stop, they change back to standing still. And this works for all four directions. That about wraps up this animations tutorial. All the code from this video will be on GitHub, so you can check the description for that. If you found this helpful, please leave a like, that helps me out a lot, and feel free to subscribe for more game dev content. Thank you so much for watching to the end, and I'll see you in the next one.